Good evening. How's everybody doing? Great. Okay. Let me tell you what I do at UCLA. And let me tell you what it means uh, in terms of both my work and the topic that we're talking about. Uh, I'm in charge of governmental relations at UCLA, so essentially my department, we are the lobbyists for UCLA. And the issues we lobby on in Sacramento, in Washington, in downtown are primarily support directly, obviously, for UCLA, but broader than that, support for public higher education. And the reason I want to make it broader is that we are all interconnected, the community colleges, CSU system, and the UC system. Anything that hurts any one segment hurts all of our segments. And so the president here at um, Santa Monica College has joined my chancellor, the president of Cal State LA, president of Cal State Northridge, in doing joint legislative meetings about funding for higher education. Because when you reduce opportunities at the community college level for students to be able to transfer, you're hurting UC and you're hurting CSU. 40% of our upper division students at UCLA are community college transfers. If you can't get your classes because of budget cuts, you're not going to be able to transfer and we're losing students. So we need you. You need us. You need a place to go. You need CSU and UC to be well funded. Your faculty come out of UC and CSU. And so there's a relationship between all three segments, and all three segments need each other. And our message to legislators in the budget process, when you hurt one segment, you hurt us all. Now, what you, you've heard certainly about Prop 30, and, and let me take a couple steps back from just Prop 30. We have all seen significant cuts in the last four years. The UC system, this year, in this fiscal year, 11-12, we've had $750 million in cuts. That's a huge number. UCLA is 20% of the system, so it's about $150 million to UCLA. The CSU system in fiscal year 11-12 got $750 million in cuts. And community colleges since 2008 have been cut $800 million. So there is a significant, profound, and I'll use the word traumatic, reduction in support for public education in California, and we have to ask why. What does public education produce? Talent, which is the workforce of today and tomorrow, and innovation, which creates new businesses and new industries today and tomorrow. If California is going to recover economically, if it's going to grow economically, it cannot do so without talent of a highly skilled workforce and innovation with new ideas, with new industries. So our policymakers are extremely short-sighted in making these cuts. Now, let's talk about how they make them and why they make them. A lot of times when you think about how the budget is constructed, Proposition 98 that was passed many years ago says that 40% of the overall state budget has to go to K through 14. So the K-12 system gets the bulk of it, but community colleges gets a significant portion of that. So that protection sounded like a good idea, that 40% of the state budget would go to K through 14. The University of California and the Cal State University system, they're not covered by Prop 98. So we're in the discretionary portion of the budget, which with all of the entitlement programs and mandates, is about 15% left. So we're in that 15% category. What else is in that category? What do you think? Healthcare. Prisons, courts, general government. We're in that part that if they're going to be cuts, that's where the cuts have to happen because they can't theoretically cut Prop 98 funding, but if that state budget goes down, that 40% goes down. That's how all of us get in the same boat. And that's how the issue of an all-cuts budget, which is what we've seen the last two years without any revenue enhancements, or as some would say tax increases, that's how we've got in this position of cut, cut, and continue to cut. When Proposition 13 was passed in 1978, 
Proposition 13 had a stipulation that in order to raise taxes, the legislature had to have a two-thirds vote. It's called a supermajority. Okay? And so, in today's legislature, there are 80 members in the Assembly, there are 40 members in the Senate. Democrats are two, short, two votes short of a supermajority on the Senate side, three votes short on the Assembly side. And so, when the Republicans don't agree to do any revenue enhancement, in order to have a balanced budget, which California has to have by constitutional mandate, you then end up doing an all-cuts budget. What the governor and the legislature did this year was say, we're going to balance the budget by the expected revenue of Proposition 30, $6 billion. But if that $6 billion doesn't materialize because Proposition 30 doesn't pass, in order to balance the budget for fiscal year 11-12, then we're going to have to do $6 billion in cuts. And so $5.4 billion in cuts will go to K through 14. Community colleges are about 338 million of those cuts. And then another 500 million to CSU and to UC. So that's what we're looking at in terms of this, this budget formula. And this continuing disinvestment. Now, how many of you know who your legislators are? Your assembly person, okay? How many of you know who your state senator is? Okay. How many of you have talked to them about the importance of higher education? I want to see a few hands. I don't see a whole lot of hands. Everybody sitting in this room needs to know who represents you and needs to be a face in front of them. Okay. My job and the job of my staff, when we talk about advocacy around the budget, it means we've got to be in front of people. We've got to tell them what they've done, and what it means. Not only what we can and can't do, but what it means both in the short term and the long term. So if you think about, again, and I use talent, there's a pipeline of talent going into the workplace. That pipeline is getting more and more narrow. And so it's a national issue where the nation is not producing enough bachelor's degree holders, enough master's degree holders, and enough doctoral degree holders for the demand in the workplace. We're not producing enough. It's a California issue as well. When I was a kid, California was always in the top three in terms of per, per, excuse me, per pupil expenditure, in terms of student achievement. California is now in that bottom five category, 46, 47, 48, depending upon the issues. How does that happen in my lifetime? How does that happen? And I'm not that old that I'm talking about 100 years. I'm talking about a continual disinvestment that has changed California's ability, California's ability to be that leader. We talked about the higher education system. All of you should know what the master plan is for higher education in California. The master plan said the top 12.5% of high school graduates are eligible for the UC, the top third eligible for the CSU, community college are to provide access for everyone else with transfer opportunities for those that desire it. And that master plan meant everybody had a shot at higher education. We're not funding the master plan today. And so that pipeline is getting more and more narrow of the talent that California needs. We need to have that kind of conversation with the people that represent us to make them understand what in fact they're doing both in the short term and in the long term. Okay? If somebody had cut me off 30 years ago, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. Okay? And somebody can't cut you off today to keep you from reaching your career goals that will impact you, your family, and your community 30 years from now. Somebody in this room is a CEO of a major corporation. Somebody in this room is going to do a discovery that's going to change the quality of life. Somebody in this room today is going to make a difference in their community in a profound way. You cannot impede that opportunity from occurring. And so your message is a message about today and a message about the future. And it's a message that legislators have to hear. People will tell you, 
Well, education is in my top five issues. Well, that means I'm not in your issues because you're only going to move one or two. If I'm not your number one issue, I might as well be your number 15 issue. People will say, well, I support you, but, well, I don't want to hear but, because what we provide is much too critical. What we give is much too necessary. And what you receive pays off over and over and over again. So you've got to know who your legislators are. You've got to be in front of them. You've got to make them understand these short-term decisions they're making <coughs> excuse me, have long-term implications. They've got to hear, <coughs> excuse me, they've got to hear your voice. Because if they don't hear your voice, who are they going to hear? Silence means consent. Must be okay. Nobody's complaining. Nobody's talking about it. It must be all right. And so my job is to be in front of people. Now they will say, <coughs> well, excuse me, I've been talking all day. <coughs> They'll say, Keith, you're paid to do this. And I'll say, yes, I am, and I'm proud to be paid to do this, but I'm not the only voice. And so advocacy means having the right person deliver the right message to the right decision maker to get the right decision made. <coughs> Could I get some water, please? <coughs> sometimes, <coughs> sometimes I'm the right person. <coughs> but... <coughs> I get, get the, We're getting you water. Okay, I'm choking. I'm sorry. I've been, I'm, I've been talking all day, which is my day. <clears throat> but sometimes the right person is a friend of that elected official, a neighbor, a campaign worker, a donor, the son or daughter of, a personal relationship, a constituent who lives in that district. You fit into one of those categories. In fitting into one of those categories, you have an opportunity to influence that decision maker to, write, to make that right decision. Now, let me give you some horrible numbers that tell you what's at stake in terms of the overall budget for community college students. Again, I told you, you've been cut $809 million as a community college system in California since 2008. <clears throat> if 30 doesn't pass, it's an additional $338 million to the community college system. What that represents is about 180,000 fewer community college students throughout California. That's a frightening number. Did you see the article in today's LA Times about the number of community college students that are t at more than one college to make sure they're able to take classes? The number that are at three, two or three different colleges, okay? That's having you run all over town. And I appreciate and I'm proud and I respect your persistence to do that because you're committed to your education in spite of the state support for it, not because of the state support. What those cuts would mean is a roughly 15% reduction, not only in funding, but in increased class sizes, in potential layoffs of faculty and staff, furloughs, in program reductions. I mean, it, it means a lot to you and a lot at stake. And again, not just this year, <clears throat> but in the future as well. I feel like I'm Paul Ryan, drinking too much water. <laughs> and so, this isn't an intellectual exercise. This is real. This is meaningful. This is about your futures. You know, maybe four months ago, President Clinton spoke at UCLA. And he said to the group, the audience, which was primarily students, he said, I have more yesterdays than I have tomorrows. And you have more tomorrows than you have yesterdays. Why should I care more about your future than you do? And think about that for a moment. Because you do have far more tomorrows than you've had yesterdays. And so your future 
future of this state. We're talking about that today. We're talking about decisions that are going to impact us for decades. Prop 13 was passed in 1978. We're still living with the after effects of Prop 13. Passed in 1978, 44 years ago. Okay? We're still living with the after effects of that. And so decisions that are making now, being made now are going to have that kind of effect. So three things I would say to you that you need to do. You need to know who represents you. You need to have a voice in who represents you by who you vote for. So you got to be registered to vote and you got to make sure you do vote. So you know who represents you. You got to be in front of who represents you. They work for you. You don't work for them. They work for you. You're a constituent. They have to see you. You have to be involved. And the third thing is, you've got to know what the issues are. You've got to be informed. You've got to be educated. You've got to know what's going on, why is it going on, and what are alternatives. You've got to know those things. So you've got to know who represents you, you've got to be in engaged and informed, and you've got to be in front of them. They've got to hear your voice. Those are the most important things that we do with budget advocacy. It's why it's a team approach. It's multi-level. If you can think of a pyramid, the bottom of that pyramid might be grassroots, where you turn out a lot of people. The top of that pyramid might be grass tops, where you want a real specific impact. But it takes all of that to be able to move public policy, particularly around public education, because remember, and I say this all the time to groups, when I go to Sacramento, when I go to Washington, I go with a bag of ideas. Labor unions have a bag of money. Indian gaming has a bag of money. Trial lawyers have a bag of money. And so if they've got a bag of money and I'm competing for attention and I'm competing for support and I've got a bag of ideas, I better make sure my ideas are good and the people delivering those ideas are informed, engaged, and impactful. So I'd say that to you about, about where we are with the budget. I'd say that to you about what's at stake. And, and, and I would just remind you of what you provide in the community college system to the state. Because it isn't just what the state gives you. It's what you give to California. 70% of the nurses in this state are educated in community colleges. 80% of firefighters, law enforcement personnel, and emergency medical technicians come out of the community college system. One of the big issues in this country and in this state is STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. At the UC system, 48% of UC's bachelor degree holders come out of the community colleges. So you're not just here taking up space you're here making a contribution and that contribution has to be supported at this level and at the next level and the level after that as well. So I just end with that thought that you're not consumers, you're contributors and we want you to continue to be able to make that contribution. So questions? I don't, I don't know, I don't know that person as well as I knew Chancellor Jack Scott. Okay. Um, I knew Jack Scott for a long time when he served in the Assembly and in the Senate, and I think that Jack Scott was a phenomenal choice for the community college system because he did have impact in Sacramento. You know, that new person is going to have to step into some big shoes. They're going to have to fill some big shoes because they're going to have to take that message uh, on behalf of the community college system. But you have to remember this, <clears throat> all politics is local. And so the message that you deliver to your local representative reinforces that larger message. Okay? Because you know what your class size is like. You know what your course offerings are like. You know what you're experiencing and how that experience changes based on the funding reductions we've seen. And so while that chancellor oftentimes is able to talk in a broad sense, you know, the 30,000 foot view, 
you're able to talk from the ground. And it's from the ground that I believe has the most impact. Okay, okay so you made a comment about how you go to Washington or Sacramento with a bag of ideas and that there are other lob lobbyists who come with a bag of money. Right. With that, with that base, I don't know if other people feel, feel this way, but that just basically validated what we've all already known is that our politicians are bought. So, how are we supposed to combat those people who come with a bag of money and you come with a bag of ideas? How are we supposed to combat those those lobbies who come with that bag of money, where the politicians are already going to take the money? Like, how are we supposed to do that? Because we can form up our grassroots organizations like. Occupy Wall Street, but we saw how they completely just fell apart because they didn't trans they didn't transform into what the Tea Party movement did and started and started putting people into positions of power. Tea Party people, and let me let me make a, a very partisan statement. When Democrats get mad, Democrats argue with each other. When Republicans get mad, they organize and they stay on message. That's true. That's true. That's and so the difference between the Occupy movement and the Tea Party movement in very simple terms. Both started with a degree of anger. The Tea Party movement got focused on campaigns, on candidates that they were supporting to win, candidates that they were supporting to lose. Okay? The Occupy movement, in a lot of ways, we're still arguing. We're still talking about the issues. We haven't moved from that discussion to an action there's plan. No center there's no center focal point for the Occupy movement. There's still there's still people camping out everywhere all over all over okay. everywhere. But there's no singular right. thing that well the like, Tea Party movement was not a not a it's a monolithic movement. It wasn't it, there wasn't one Tea Party. There are a bunch of no yeah tea there, party there groups. One, there's there's one there's there's different Tea Party organizations, but they all have one particular goal. Because they said we're going to defeat Obama, and the way we're going to do that, we're going to elect Republicans that are going to support our position. Okay, now, okay. We haven't as an Occupy movement said we're going to defeat you know, Republicans that are opposed to our ideas. You, you've got to translate into political action. Money does make a difference in politics. It clearly does. It's unfortunate that it does. It's a reality. Higher education doesn't have a PAC. A PAC is a political action committee. A political action committee does make campaign contributions. Other entities, other organizations, they have PACs. And they use money to influence. And so if you don't have that, what do you have? It's having that grassroots movement that can make that difference if it is mobilized, if it is focused, if it is organized. Because in the end, people have to go into that ballot booth and they have to vote. And so money can encourage you to get there. Money can tell you how to think. But at some point, you've got to get people into that booth to vote. And so I think that's one of the things we have to do. The other thing that we have to do, and I'll, again, I'll make a very partisan political statement. We have to cultivate and support candidates that are in agreement with an agenda. Okay? So if I take the Tea Party movement as an example, they supported anti-tax candidates. They didn't ask you a whole bunch of other questions because they were focused on tax issues. Okay? And so... They nurtured, have supported, encouraged, and fundraised for those kind of candidates. If you think about an education agenda, which I think about, we need to be identifying, nurturing, supporting candidates, both Democrats and Republicans, that are going to support education, that are going to say, it's my top issue, it's number one on my list. We hope that they do when they get there, and I'm saying in a more proactive way, We've got to encourage that from the start. And so that's a threshold question to ask anybody that asks you for your vote. Ask them what they support. Ask them why don't they support higher ed as their number one issue. Ask them what are they going to do to support higher ed when they get to Sacramento or to Washington or city government. I think we have to do more of those kinds of things. Those are things that are based on organization, based on having a clear set of ideas, based on influencing people where you can. Okay? The other thing that's different, and it's something that all of you that are students here can do, you all probably know somebody who's running for office, or you support somebody that's running for office. 
being a campaign volunteer, making phone calls, knocking on doors. That gives you a different level of access to that person when they get in office because you were with them before they got there. They don't forget that. They don't forget that. And it's not simply so you can get a job with them, letter of recommendation. It's that you want access to them. And so finding a way to have access, that can mitigate that bag of money. And so that's why we look for people that have those strong personal relationships with elected officials. Because again, I don't come with a bag of money, so I want the right message by the right messenger to make that decision maker make the right decision. Successful sometimes, not always.